Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be able to present the work um, that we're doing in Mozambique with our colleagues, the Mozambique Wildlife Alliance and Sense Clue, um, and Cassandra, who's part of Elephants Alive, but registered at Wageningen University. So he'll be, each of them will um, be giving a portion of this presentation. So just to explain visually um, human-elephant coexistence and the different forms of human-elephant conflict that one gets. Um, in South Africa, there's a mild form of human-elephant conflict because people are very concerned about the impact that elephants have on the large tree component. And then in places like Mozambique, um, you get elephants threatening the livelihoods of people by constant crop raiding. And then you get a scenario where people's safety is threatened and the safety of elephants, vice versa. And then the extreme case where either elephants get poached or people get killed by aggressive elephants. So why is human-elephant conflict um, so important and what can we actually expect? Well, if we look at the history, a um, hundred years ago, human numbers have increased from 1.6 billion to 7.7 .7 billion. That's a 380% increase over a hundred years. And at the same time, elephant numbers, um, they assumed that they were more than 10 million a hundred years ago and they're over 400,000. So that's approximately a 97% decline in elephant numbers. And globally, elephants have been registered through the IUCN, the African elephant as, African savanna elephant as endangered, and the forest elephant is critically endangered. And what we know is that 76% of elephants are actually spread across international boundaries, while 57.4% of elephants' current range is outside of protected areas. So what this all means is that I certainly think human-elephant conflict is yet to stay, and that's why it's such an important topic to address. So if you look at where our study area is as Elephants Alive, um, we enjoy going, or we enjoy not having a study area defined by basically saying that our study area is defined where the elephants take us. And at this stage, we're working um, across Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area and Lubombo Transfrontier um, Conservation Area. So we don't only work inside protected areas, but outside of protected areas. And um, this map shows is a collation of our elephant tracking data. This is just the bulls, which are the great explorers. The females are far more site faithful, so they're not so widely spread across the landscape. But what they have defined is very vital corridors linking these transfrontier conservation areas. And our partners, um, the Mozambique Wildlife Alliance, basically asked us if we would help them try and address human-elephant conflict south of the Salve River, which is a massive area of about 175,000 square kilometers. And it's very daunting when you get a request like that and you're only a small NGO. But um, why and how can we possibly mitigate elephants? So we thought of a strategy which started with understanding elephant movements and that involves deploying collars, then discussing and consulting with the community to find out what are the issues and how they see conflict can be alleviated through questionnaires and workshops. And then very importantly, to offer immediate safety to people. So that's a reactionary approach. Um, and the Mozambique Wildlife Alliance have done a fantastic job, which Joao will tell you more about, um, in terms of the elephant shepherd units that move across the landscape addressing conflict in a reactionary way. And then it's really important to protect people's assets. So that's why the conflict is there. People are worried about their livelihoods. And there's two ways that we, you can do it. The one is through non-income generating soft barriers. And the other is through income generating soft barriers. And our partners, the Mozambique Wildlife Alliance, 
are using slightly harder barriers, so cluster fencing. Um, but the combination of this is really quite powerful. And then another method, we like using technology, and this is where um, we've got EarthRanger to thank, so thank you very much. We're very active on the EarthRanger platform, um, is to develop predictive risk maps, um, which can hopefully be automated at least on a monthly basis to increase the efficiency of operation and mitigate over such a large area. So Cassandra will tell you more about the models that is developed um, involving information technology so that we can reduce that massive area over which to address human elephant conflict. And we fully believe, like a number of partners have said at this conference, that by collective problem solving between various stakeholders, it is possible firstly to increase connectivity between protected areas, because I think we all know that in terms of elephants, the protected areas are actually too small and um, protecting these corridors that link, trans, that link trans frontier conservation areas is really important. And then with that, you have to increase people's tolerance towards elephants as well. So just to quickly run through these methods that we've used. So Elephants Alive has been tracking elephants since 1998, so that's 25 years. We've had um, over 300 collaring operations. And um, in 2016, we started collaring elephants in Mozambique because that's where they were taking us. So for the past eight years, we've been working with our colleagues there. And then in 2018, we actually saw that, well, often these elephants are more outside of the protected areas than in the protected areas. So we started collaring elephants outside of protected areas deliberately. Um, and then, it's, as I said, it's really important to, before you start any strategy, to get an understanding of what the community want and how they see it. Um, and having workshops and um, consultations and questionnaires uh, must be part of the process. And then I'm going to hand you over to Joelle, who will tell you more about ensuring human safety by deploying rapid response units and how he's used technology and um, these wonderful dedicated people. So he has a photo of um, Mr. Kubana and Mr. Mabutu and Antonia Alvarso, who's the program uh, manager, and he's going to tell you all about what they've achieved. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. So, yeah. So yeah, uh, good morning all. So my name is João. Uh, the other João, because the the founder is also João. So I'm I'm also the other João. So wh what I can what I can share uh, with you uh, in a, in a in a brief uh, uh, presentation is uh, uh, what how, how we manage the operation for this specific specific project with elephants alive. This is a very uh, important project for us because it, uh, it addresses an issue very close to the main city of uh, Mozambique, which is Maputo, uh, and that creates uh, enormous problems, starting from a community base, they are the first layer of impact, but then it, it, it scales up very quickly to political influence, etc. So this area is very critical uh, and it's a, a good barometer of uh, the impact of um, uh, 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 human wildlife conflict. Um, I'm going to share how we uh, operationalize this this uh, project. So, what we have, we have a, a, a small team: the, the manager, the assistants, and we have four officers uh, on the field. Uh, and we use equipment to monitor where the officers are. So they all have an in-reach uh, GPS tracker, they have a motorbike with a tracker, and they have a phone uh, to, to report everything, take photos, and establish comms when, when needed. The tools we use uh, are Earth Ranger. Earth Ranger is our uh, tool of choice for uh, gather information. So all our organization, the, the MWA has a lot of projects and has a lot of uh, other um, uh, impact nationwide, uh, and we, we only use Earth Ranger as our input, input uh, source. To report everything that we have on Earth Ranger, we use Tableau. Uh, we are very keen in, in the way we organize the input to the, to the Earth Ranger. 
Um, and we only create input reports if they answer to uh, strategic and relevant questions that we need to see reported. So uh, Tableau is the tool we use to create dashboards to answer the strategic questions. Uh, we also use WhatsApp. There are different apps, but uh, WhatsApp forms. So our officers, they have forms that are the same as the reports for a ranger. Uh, so it facilitates um, them to share the, the information. Um, so the way we are working on this specific project is we have a, a, an assistant, an HLBC assistant, that um, takes calls from, so, so what, the SDAI are the local authorities, DAIs are district authorities uh, that receive all the information from the field to see if there is conflict or not. So we get calls from them on a weekly basis and we call them, there is a relationship with these local authorities. Um, ANAC uh, is the nationwide uh, uh, authority for, the, for conservation in general. Uh, and we have also, we also receive uh, information from them. And then we have Earth Ranger with the uh, uh, proximity alerts and geofences generating also reports of human wildlife conflict. These are the three sources that we get and we gather for um, uh, uh, human wildlife conflict. And then from there, we act, uh, we analyze the information, we confirm the information, and then we deploy the officers to go and answer to the conflict. Uh, we have different tools, uh, we have different SOPs, uh, and, and a lot of solutions, so this would be another presentation. Um, there are SOPs in place, so for example in geofences, let me see here if I, yeah. So these are examples of geofences there at, at the left. Uh, geo, we have the, the geofences there, the 15 kilometers, 10 kilometers, and 5 kilometers. They generate proximity alerts. For example, if uh, an elephant gets into the 15 kilometers, the SOP says uh, raise the level of, of awareness and uh, get in touch with the local authorities to be prepared. Uh, if they, it reaches the five, there is another SOP, etc. So there are SOPs for each uh, geofence to, to answer. Um, and then we have the trackers, so we see where our operators are, and we can manage easily. So. This was an elephant here. We see this is a motorbike that came and pushed the elephant away uh, and, or, or guaranteed that the elephant was in a safe zone. So this is the way we, we, we manage um, using Earth Ranger. This is the re report structure. So every conflict or every bit of information that is confirmed about uh, conflict is logged in, in in the report. And then we use Tableau to uh, to, to manage all the data and have uh, everything in a visible way. So this is one of our human wildlife conflict dashboards that you can see per species, uh, percentage of, uh, of success, etc., etc., etc. et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. A lot of uh, relevant and important answers to strategic questions. Um, in this specific case, this project, I'm already going over my three minutes, so in this project uh, we have some numbers, so number of incidents involving elephants, uh, this is for the past 18 months, 261 uh, incidents, 78% were uh, answered to. Uh, we do a lot of uh, workshops and trainings, so to capacitate people to know how to use deterrents and whatever. So 618 people were trained, um, and more than 80,000 kilometers on, on this project alone. So, yeah, Michel, this is a short <laughs> presentation on what we have, yeah. Thank you very much. So a great success rate um, with the rapid response unit um, as a strategy and there will be more rapid response units um, coming out in future. Then another, as I mentioned, um, to sort of tie in these practical on the ground strategies with very high in tech which Cassandra will tell you about and um, Jan Kies maybe a little bit at the end. Um, it's also really important to protect people's livelihoods and there's no way around being practically on the ground, having low cost methods with which people can um, protect their crops. And so we've um, we partnered with various countries that are specialized in 
different ways to protect crops with using soft barriers. So we got um, colleagues from the PAMS Foundation in Tanzania, and they've got experience with using more than 450 kilometers of chili rag fence. Um, and they came to do a training workshop. Um, the flashing lights come from Botswana, the smelly elephant repellent method from Uganda, the metal strip fencing um, from Kenya. And it was just actually a great community vibe to get people, specialists from different countries to come in and basically share that we all have the same issues, but let's solve it collectively. This works in my country. Why don't you try it? So we had great buy-in from the community. And we've also just erected our first um, elephant watchtower, which will also become an educational center. And there's a bee room in there to process honey because we also are implementing um, income generating barriers, soft barriers. So the income generating soft barriers are the bee high fences that Dr. Lucy King um, has really spearheaded. And it's wonderful to use bees in the sense that they not only pollinate your crops to increase production, they protect the fields, but they also produce honey, which is important for income. Um, and then there's other unpalatable barriers that you could use, like chili, um, which has a great market value. And also, we did a lot of experiments in South Africa with semi habituated elephants to try and understand which unpalatable crops that are known to the essential oil industry are also totally unpalatable to elephants. So we came up with a couple of those and we're busy um, doing proof of concept in South Africa and learning all about the yield and the growth forms of the top rated unpalatable crops because that's definitely a money spinner that could be rolled out in Mozambique. And I'm going to hand over to Cassandra, who's going to explain to you how you can use technology to try and address human-elephant conflict over 175,000 square kilometer area and try and narrow it down to something more manageable. Yes, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, so yeah, what Michelle already kind of indicated is that we have a very large area we're working with. And a lot of these mitigation methods uh, are available, however, they're often very cost or labor intensive. Uh, and because these are in often very rural communities that are subsistence farmers, they don't all have the funds to do this. And it often comes down to external funds like NGOs, government agencies that try to help out. Uh, however, when you're working in 175,000 square kilometer, it's important to know where you're gonna um, invest these kinds of uh, mitigation strategies and also to what intensity, like you can go for electric fences, which are very expensive, very good, but you can also just go for uh, kind of digging trenches around your crops to prevent them from coming in like that. So you kind of want to adjust your density based on the relative risk that you have. So that's what I've been working with, with sensing clues and elephants alive and a lot of data coming from Mozambique Wildlife Alliance. So how did I approach this? I basically used the species distribution model as the name already states, I'm very quickly going into how the general concept works. Uh, it's normally used for modeling the distribution of a species. So what you do is you collect a lot of observation data of where this species is occurring through just visual observations or uh, just online data. And then you get, based on literature and expert knowledge, some layers that might influence this occurrence. So here you can think of some climate, um, indicators, geology, soil, that your species might need to be able to occur in a certain area. The advantage to this is you can then get an indication of what combination of these variables uh, are necessary for your species. Uh, and then you can see what the distribution is. This can also give an indication of where there might be a possible uh, area that might be suitable for reintroduction or an area that you haven't searched for this species where they might be already be occurring. And what it's very often used for is for future predictions. So by using uh, different climate scenarios, you can kind of see how is my area going to change and how is the distribution going to increase or shrink or going to move uh, up or down in, uh, in the world, basically. So what I did, I don't have a species, but I basically acted like my crop rating events were a species in that sense to see how that distribution works based on the layers. The next step is identifying the layers. So we're going to start very simple with some uh, basic layers, uh, which is distance to protected areas. 
These are very logical. For instance, uh, in the protected areas and just around them, there is a higher density of elephants, which also means that the chance of an interaction is just a lot higher. Uh, then we have the digital elevation model. This might influence where your crops are located, but also um, elephants are known to not really like a lot of differences in elevation, so this way you can also see where they might be avoiding. And then lastly, the distance to the crops from these three layers. Uh, if you don't have crops, you're not going to have crop rating, so it's just a very strong layer in that sense. Then we have more specialized layer for our specific scenario. The first one is the EVI. This is the Enhanced Vegetation Index. It basically, using satellite data, indicates how dense your vegetation is based on the, the greenness of the vegetation. Uh, and what research has shown is that elephants cooperate more in the period where they're switching from grazing to browsing. Uh, because here the grasses start to mature, which means the nutrient quality of that vegetation goes down, which is exactly coinciding with the time that most crops start to mature and their uh, nutrient density and uh, energy is uh, going way up. Then we have the phosphorus layer. So what we at Elephant's Life have noticed a few times with uh, projects we're working on and also research we've done and a few literature sources is that um, phosphorus keeps coming back as either a correlated variable. It's at least influencing something in the behavior of these elephants from what we can see. Uh, and this is also pretty logical in a certain way because uh, in tropical, subtropical areas, they're often very deficient in phosphorus. And phosphorus is just really imp important for fertility, reproduction, and bone structure. So if they're deficient, uh, they're probably going to be trying to get more of it, which in that time period is probably going to be located in the crops. Then the last layer that we included at the moment is the canopy count. So uh, we've also noticed, and also other uh, people that work with elephants have uh, found that they use kind of launching pads. These are little forested areas where they stay before they start cooperating and where they also come back to after cooperating to kind of hide, prevent uh, detection, and not get into the, the actual negative conflicts uh, after they've basically cooperated. These layers mostly were collected from Google Earth Engine. Uh, this is a massive public data archive that just gives uh, free access to a lot of environmental layers, like the actually massive database of climate, like you can see surface temperature, indications of nutrients in the soil, uh, basically everything people are developing, and if they want to make it open source, they put it on here. So it's just an amazing platform. And then I'm going to quickly go over one of the variables in specific. So in this case, I chose phosphorus again. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because that would just be too much, but I wanted to show what is happening in reality that we can see from the data and then how that is influencing my model. So you can see on the left side, if I can keep my pointer a bit less trembling, uh, is you have the red distribution that goes behind the blue one, which is where there were no cooperating events that we, we know. That doesn't mean nothing happened there, but not that we knew. So they're pseudo absence points. And there are 10,000 random points throughout the whole uh, spatial layer. And it gives an indication of the distribution of phosphorus that is available to these elephants for what they can select. And the blue distribution is basically where we had cooperating events. And where you can see there is a very clear separation where they're selecting for areas that are higher in phosphorus. Um, which is also really nice to see this kind of separation because if you're going to model, this means that using this variable, your model is really going to be able to say this is more likely a place where cooperating could happen. Then on the right side, you see how it is actually affecting uh, my model. So it, all the colored lines is I did a tenfold cross validation, which means I created ten different models, and then the black line is uh, the average of all the of all the models. And what you can see is here you see that the clear separation starts and the peak from the cooperating events around 28 to 32 uh, parts per million in the soil. And here you see that this is also where you start seeing a steep increase in your suitability value of your map for those pixels. So that's kind of how uh, each variable is influencing the model. And this, I just quite kind of wanted to show, this is the phosphorus layer when we visualize it. The blue is where phosphorus is uh, low, and the redder it is, the, the more phosphorus present. And the black points are the, the cooperating events. And you can see they're very clearly following this dark red line. And also here you see a little darker red line, which is also where these points are located. Of course, not all of them, but mostly from what we can see. Then the relative information gain, so you can also get an indication of how much information does each variable add to my specific model. 
Uh, then you see the first one is, of course, distance to crops. Again, with our crops, you're not going to have crop rating, so that's very logical. And here again, phosphorus just keeps coming back as the second most important variable in this uh, model. Uh, age population density is, by the way, the human population density, just quickly. And at the moment, so we're going to include more, which I'll come to later, EVI is the only dynamic variable. So this means that we update this and this changes every month, which means we can get a different indication of where is the risk the highest for each month by seeing what was happening before. Um, yes. Then, uh, now we know which variables are important to our model, but we still don't really know, is my model performing well? So I did this using ROC curve. ROC curve, I'm not going to say the full name. It's a very complicated name. It's really not that necessary. Uh, and I'll quickly explain how this works. It's basically a very simple concept. So let's say our variable that we're looking at increases if you go to the right. And then the red elephants are where there is no elephant's presence. And the green ones is where you have presences of elephants. What you basically then do is you set a cutoff value. Everything above this threshold is, uh, your model says, they're probably going to be present. Everything below, your model is going to say, OK, they're absent. Um, so what you can see is, here is that you have very high sensitivity. So basically, everywhere elephants are present, your model is also predicting they're present. But this is going at the cost of your specificity, uh, which is where your elephants are absent. It's still predicting that they're present. So then we move our threshold. And then we get a better prediction, which, but it's still not optimal. But it's at least able to differentiate between some areas where they're likely not going to be present and they're indeed not present at all. And then we keep doing this basically until we find a perfect separation. This doesn't mean you get 100% correct in specificity and sensitivity. It just means this is the best we can get with our model. And then by looking at, so this is actually from my data ball. You can ignore the dark black line for at the moment. But what you then do, this is basically the AUC, the area under the curve. If you have a completely random model, there's basically no indication your data is not really helping your model. You get a line that goes from the bottom left to the top right. And that basically means you have a 50-50 separation and an area under the curve of 0 0.5. If you have a perfect model, you go to an area under the curve of 1. This is because if you look here, specificity is the proportion that you predicted correctly. So this means from your negatives, you predicted 100% correctly that they're all going to be negative. And here for the specificity, if you predict they're going to be present, uh, the model, you're 100% correct, basically. So that's where you want to go. So this is our line that we got with our model, which had an AUC of 0 0.93. Uh, so what is generally accepted is that a model between an area under the curve of 0.7 to 0.8 is a it does something between 8 and 9 is a good model, and above 9 it means it's working very well. So our model seems to be working very well when we put a threshold value of a suitability of about 0.17. And as you can also see, we have a specificity and sensitivity of almost 0.9, and it's very similar, which means it's also not preferring to misclassify absences versus uh, presences, which means it's a nicely balanced model as well. But this is very abstract. So these are the layers that we got out of it for each month. So it's also changing per month. Uh, and when we remove everything of 0.17, so that's just the gray areas, and everything with color is basically the values that were above 0.17. The bluer it is, the less suitable, and the greener, the yellower it is, the more suitable your area, and the red crosses are where our cooperating events actually happened in those months. What I then did to kind of get an indication how does my model compare to the map actually work, we uh, grouped the suitabilities from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, et cetera. And then we saw, looked at what is the proportion of cooperating events that we found versus if we just do a random draw. And if our model is working well, the higher you go into your suitability groups, the more your proportion of cooperating events should be. Uh, this is also what you can see. So if we fit a linear model, we get an R squared of 0.93, which means that 93% of our variation can be explained by looking at these 10% groups. I do want to say that this y-axis is on a log scale, which means the relation is in reality exponential. So it's uh, even nicer than just a straight line. Uh, so the, the ROC shows that our model is working. The, the suitability map shows it's working. And we lose a lot of area. But what now? So using this, we were able to reduce our area of 175,000 square kilometers to about 156,000 square kilometers, uh, by 156 square kilometers, sorry, which means we only have about 17,000 square kilometers left of where we really should focus. 
Again, this shouldn't mean that we're going to ignore the other areas because elephants are just opportunistic, so they can always happen something somewhere. It's just the, the, the most efforts and the most intense mitigation methods we should be applying uh, in the areas where the risk is basically highest. But 17,000 square kilometers is still a very large area also for the rapid response unit to be able to, to access uh, uh, in a daily basis. So we do want to reduce this even more. So we have a few roads that we want to want to take. So the tracking data that we got in southern Mozambique as well. So we have a few elephants that are known to really cooperate a lot. Uh, and for now, we've also already included home ranges of these elephants to see what locations they are in that month because that area is also higher at risk. Uh, this is already working. There's a few little things that we're still improving on that, but it's already reducing the area by uh, an, an amount as well. Then we want to include the type of crops. So in a very extreme example, uh, let's say your elephants only cooperate corn, and let's say 30% of our area that's left is corn, then we can get rid of the other 70%. It's of course going to be a bit more distributed, but it would help reduce the area a lot. Same for the growth stage. Uh, so there's probably going to be certain growth stages of your specific crops that uh, provide even more nutrients that are more beneficial to the elephants. And also they have to consider that if they wait too long, um, your crop's going to be harvested so there's nothing left. Uh, so this would give more detail in the temporal uh, uh, side of it as well. And then lastly, phosphorus. So like I said, we did include phosphorus. However, this was phosphorus in a static way in the soil. This is not per se accessible to the elephants in that way. So we want to get a... We're trying to work with uh, some people to set up a project to get a dynamic layer of phosphorus in the vegetation specifically, um, which again would in the temporal side show what areas at this specific moment are high in phosphorus, which they might be selecting for. Um, I do want to say we are noticing phosphorus is very interesting. We don't know for sure yet if it's causality, if it's correlated or whatever, but we're, it's definitely worth pursuing because it just keeps coming back for us. And then in summary, so yeah, the model is reducing the area by a lot. We definitely have some improvements we want to make. It has now been, I think, three or four months that I've actually been working on this with Elephants Life and Sensing Clues uh, and Mozambique Wildlife Alliance then as well. Um, but it's a project that we have funding for for about three years. Um, so there's hopefully going to be a lot of improvements and extra layers that we are going to be able to include. And then I'm going to give it back to Michelle. Thank you. I'm just going to um, rush through this. So um, these risk map functionalities, what does that enable us to do? And basically it helps us put localized human-elephant conflict in perspective. Um, it also helps us to know what mitigation strategies to implement where and for how long. And this is really important when you're working over such a big area. Um, it helps us move from reactive short-term strategies at local level to more longer-term proactive strategies at landscape level, um, especially if you start spatially planning where you're putting income-generating barriers as opposed to non-income-generating soft barriers and cluster fencing. Um, it helps us plan ahead of time to prevent fragmentation of the landscape. It helps ensure sustainability of biodiversity objectives because obviously linking and um, fostering coexistence values in these corridors is vital to biodiversity objectives to keep the movement open between protected areas. It helps us reduce human-elephant conflict and improve the harvests of people. It helps ensure social economic development in harmony with wildlife needs. And it, and it helps to promote cross-border communication between stakeholders. So, um, you know, with these elephants moving into Mozambique, a whole new web of friendships have developed with various people like Sensing Clue and Mozambique Wildlife Alliance, and it just goes on. So um, elephants don't only connect landscapes, they also connect people. Um, and as I think a theme that's come out quite a lot in this conference is that collective problem solving is the way to go. Um, and it actually enables us to connect landscapes and also, very importantly, to increase tolerance between species. So thank you very much um, to our sponsors and also to various people for all the logistical support and knowledge sharing and I would just like to say a very special thank you to Anka Bedetti, a valuable team member which we recently lost.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Jan Kees. I'm uh, the founder of Sense Clues and work together with, uh, with well, Cassander and Elephants on Life for quite some time now. Uh, not yet very intensely with the most weekend side, but uh, in the end that will of course all come together. Because what you see here is a very deep scientific development in which lots of aspects come together and need to come together um, that you actually would like to make transferable to other sites as well, and to scale, and to make in a way robustness, to build in robustness, which you cannot expect from, uh, with all respect, Cassandra, it's a student project, of course, it's a master student, and you saw it's excellent work, but you cannot expect from students to deliver a fully scalable solution that can be used in every other place. And that will include different types of technologies which are not within the scope of uh, a student in ecology or etc. So what we try to do and what we are doing together and also here in the conference is bringing together the and uh, Michelle and her team are developing need to be embedded in technologies that can be taken up by new generations of students because and new generations of your staff which may move and go and move and go uh, between the years and to build in continuity, to build in these uh, capabilities uh, you need very powerful technical skills as well. So what we do, and we also are now exploring more in-depth collaborations between Earth Ranger and Sense Inclus to see the data is already collected with one method or several methods actually in Xiao, uh, and then how to pick up that data and develop these models further in a way that we can also Im Im include more people from the community in the research activities, but also in the other aspects of developing solutions that can be used here on the ground in Mozambique, but also in other counties. So uh, I'm very proud and honored to be working uh, with you guys. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, well, the way we work is that we, we work, many of them from Europe, our people have a passion for wildlife, but are working for a bank or for other institutions. And they want to bring their skills to the places where they are mostly needed. Well, and uh, organizations like Elephants Alive are on the ground in the field and bringing and, and kind of fueling and funneling these skills and these hours precious hours towards building solutions together is, is one of the ways that we can make, uh, make a difference here. So thank you very much. Um, we are still engaged for maybe one or two years before this project is really kind of finished, but that's only the beginning again because new research questions will pop up and new challenges will be there and uh, together we will make it.